I walked the boardwalk with Jess. We had been engaged for two weeks, and we both took this Friday off to spend an extra long weekend together on a beach trip to celebrate. I was so happy that she said yes. We had been together for two years and I was swimming in the joy of imagining our life together. It was like being in a bubble of happiness. At the time I wish I knew that it wouldn't last. I wish. That's getting ahead. I'm writing this not in hopes of getting help, but only as a record for whoever finds this device. We walked the boardwalk, hand in hand, both looking at all the fun and colorful shops lying in the pathway, bathed in the bright summer sun. Hey, Troy, let's check out some of these shops. I've never actually gone in one. Her voice was like soft music to me. I wonder if she was feeling the same euphoria as I was. Yeah, let's check them out. I've always found this stuff kind of interesting. We walked and chatted until we came upon the first shop. It was a souvenir and toy shop, full of kids toys and appropriately themed beach souvenirs. You know the type, full of rocks that were found on the beach, postcards and shark tooth necklaces. Your standard souvenir shop. The toys were neat too. We walked the aisles looking at the various stuffed aquatic creatures, made out of bright colorful fabric and all the sand toys and kite flying equipment you could ever need. It was a neat store, but we soon decided to move on without buying anything. The next shop we came upon was painted maroon, and had a badly hand-painted pop by the sailor man painted on the door. The sign above the door read, Auntie Anne's Antiques, and what you could tell was once gold-colored cursive lettering, but was rusted and aged due to the salt in the air. Let's go in. Jess's eyes lit up and she practically dragged me in with her. This shop was packed with oddities. Bare-boned metal shelves and clearly old glass cases, holding tons of meticulously arranged objects covered the entire store, leaving only just enough room to walk around and look. Everything had a small white tag on it with a handwritten price. There was pottery, metal sculptures, and an overabundance of old rotodial phones dotted the shop. There were crystals and old jewelry, and old decayed wood objects whose purpose I could not discern. Truly, it was all rather fascinating. I found an old K-Bar knife that I really liked. I examined the dark aged steel of the blade and the worn leather handle. It would cost me a cool 50 bucks. But I had saved a decent chunk of money for this trip, so I figured that I could treat myself. Hey babe, check out this knife that I found. I think it's pretty neat and I'm going to buy it. I said to Jess who was about 5 feet away examining the rocks and crystals. Yeah, yeah, you get your boy stuff. But if you're getting something, I'm getting something too. She held up a black crystal. It was about the length and thickness of an empty paper towel roll, and rested in a plain metal base. Look, you think it's just a black crystal, right? I raised an eyebrow at her, and then she held it in the sunlight coming through a nearby window, and it revealed that the crystal was actually a dark red. The sunlight going through it sent rays of deep red light onto the floor and walls. I think I'll put it on our window to catch the sunlight. I admit it, that is pretty cool. Yeah, let's get it. The tag on the crystal read, $30. A little pricey for a fancy rock, but whatever. I was buying a knife that who knew how old it was. We went to check out and a lady looking to be in her mid-40s greeted us. You must be Auntie Anne. You have a, such a cool store. I said to her. She laughed gently as she took the knife and stone from me and Jazz. Oh, no, no. Auntie Anne was my great-grandmother. She opened this shop 60 years ago. She looked me in the eye and then tapped her name tag, which clearly read Claire. I felt my face flush a bit. How embarrassing. How would I miss that? 
I heard Jess stifle a giggle and turn her head away. I handed Claire the money and I took the knife. Claire held the crystal out to me and I tried to take it too, but Claire wouldn't let go. I pulled a little harder but she had an iron grip on it. I looked at her but her eyes were focused on the crystal. Claire? I questioned. Suddenly, she looked up at me and she released the crystal. Oh, I'm sorry. This piece has been with my family since we had opened. I'm just a little sad to see it go. I'm sure it'll find better use in your home than wasting away on these shelves, though. You have a good day now. And with that, she walked into the back room of the shop. Just made a circular motion around the side of her head with her pointer finger, indicating that the lady must be a psycho. After spending the rest of the weekend wandering the tourist beach town and enjoying the sun and sand, we decided to return home. I put the knife into the drawer of my nightstand on my side of the bed, and she placed the crystal on the window seal where it could catch the most sunlight. Life seemed normal for a few weeks. Working, cooking, and doing all the stuff that a newly engaged couple does. I woke up to light directly in my eyes. I squinted and realized the crystal was refracting the morning sun directly into my eyes in its signature shade of red. It was like looking at the sun through red tinted sunglasses. It was shaded but the sun was still the sun and it hurt. I rolled over and I decided to go back to sleep for just a few more minutes. I was falling. It was dark. I screamed but my voice just seemed to disappear. Like there was nothing to carry it. Suddenly, I was no longer falling, but floating in this infinite abyss. I looked around and saw nothing. I attempted to move but with nothing to push off of. I was wiggling helplessly, and suddenly I heard it. I heard it and I felt it at the same time. A deep rumbling changing in pitch and tone in ways a human cannot. It vibrated through my entire body and assailed my ears. As I listened though, I realized that it was a voice, and although it was not speaking English, I could understand it. I could see no source for it, but I knew that it was in this void with me. Or rather, I was in this void with it. Human. It rumbled agonizingly slow. I attempted to speak, but as I opened my mouth, it was forced shut by an unseen voice. The voice rumbled again. You have been chosen. I struggled against the force in an attempt to speak and it responded by restricting the movement of my entire body. It was as if I was being crushed by all directions. I couldn't even breathe. Panic and claustrophobia welled up inside me. From the abyss, a long, dark red tentacle seemed to appear from nowhere and stretch towards me. There was nothing that I could do. I could not move. I could not breathe or thrash. I could only watch. The tentacle stopped in front of my face. It moved to touch the center of my forehead. Ice cold waves shocked through my body. And then I was in a convenience store. I tried to move but I could not. I watched from behind a shelf of goods as a ski masked robber pointed a gun at the clerk. But it wasn't me moving. In a window reflection, I saw that it was me, but this body was moving on its own accord. I was just looking through its eyes. I saw myself lift a hand up towards the man and watched as his gun seemed to just fly out of his hands and into mine. The robber looked terrified. Suddenly, I'm back in my apartment, but still not to control. I am removing the cap from a gallon of milk. When I drop the cap on the ground and it rolls under the fridge, I feel myself take a sharp breath of frustration and I bend down to look under the fridge. The cap is rolled clear to the back. I open my palm and the cap wistfully flies into it. 
I am floating back in the void. The tentacles are seeding back into the depths of the black. My body rumbles violently with the impact of its voice. Use it, Use it as, as you as will. will. And then my eyes open and I am back on my bed. I can feel myself covered in sweat, but I am freezing cold. Jess is sleeping peacefully next to me. What the hell just happened? Did I just have a night terror? That was an oddly specific and memorable night terror. I rolled over and I looked at the crystal. The light ray was now about a foot above my head. I must have been out for about 30 or 40 minutes. I had seen too many sci-fi and fantasy movies to discount what had just happened to me. I recalled the strange visions that I was shown. I was chosen. Use it wisely. I sat up in excitement, not really believing what I was thinking. Was I given superpowers? I scoffed to myself, but noticed the TV remote on the dresser at the far end of the room. I double checked to make sure that Jess was still asleep, so I wouldn't make a fool of myself. And then I held out my hand to the remote. I willed it to me. Nothing happened. I laughed in my mind at the absurdity of it, and I decided to try one more time. With all of my mental energy, I willed the remote into my hand, thought of nothing but the remote coming to me, and then it flew at breakneck speed right into my hand. The back of the remote slammed into my hand with a loud slap, and it fell into my lap. I winced in pain and I held my hand. It worked. My god, it worked. I looked up at the crystal with excitement. Today was Saturday, so no work. I decided I was going to test this ability more. I needed to know what I was capable of, what were the limits, and what might happen if I overdid it. I told Jess that me and the boys were going shooting. I grabbed my Walther PPQ-45 pistol and ammunition and headed out the door. I drove about 45 minutes out into the forested area outside of my town. I found an old service road leading to an empty lot that was once used to stage trees from loggers. I parked my car on the road at the entrance to the dirt lot so no one could surprise me. I placed a large, fist-sized rock on the ground in front of me. I looked at it, and I held out a hand and I willed it to float at eye level in front of me. Wary of willing it too fast and hurting me like the remote had. I wiggled slightly then lifted it up and held itself exactly where I wanted it. I made it move in circles, transfixed by what I was able to do. I then looked at a nearby tree and with a sudden burst of thought, demanded that the rock launch itself at the tree. The rock listened and exploded towards the tree faster than I could see. There was a loud thunk and the entire tree vibrated. I examined the spot of impact and found the rock had lodged about 7 or 8 inches into the trunk. Next, I decided to mess with my gun. I took the unloaded pistol out and I placed it on the ground. I willed it into the air in front of me. I kept it there as I loaded a single round into the clip. I held the clip out and I let it float out of my hand and into the gun. I was glad to know that I had some fine motor control. I aimed it at the same tree and I willed the trigger back. It fired. I fell to my knees and the gun fell too. I had real powers. I decided that that was enough for the day and I headed home. I spent the next few weeks using it only for nominal tasks. I didn't want to tell Jess until I had full knowledge over what I had attained. I used it to pour my coffee, to load my clothes into the washer and dryer. At work, I practiced fine control by using it to type and write. After about two months had passed, I decided to tell Jess, but was deciding how to go about it when an opportunity presented itself. Troy, I heard her call from the kitchen. Can you come help me? I walked in and I found her looking under the fridge. 
I recalled the vision I had been shown of retrieving the milk cap from under the fridge. Yeah, what's up? Did you drop something under there? No, but the water line is leaking. Can you pull the fridge out for me so we can get a closer look? What a perfect opportunity. Jess, there is something really good that I need to tell you. But let me just show you instead. She gave me a strange look. Okay, sure, go for it, I guess. She said with uncertainty. I nodded and I looked at the fridge. I closed my eyes and held out my hand to it. This was my first time moving something this large, but I knew that I could do it. I called for her to move out. I felt the familiar rush and the release of the power. And then nothing. The fridge did not move. The ability did not come. I heard Jess release a blood-curdling scream from the living room. She was just right next to me. How? I raced to the living room and found her pinned to the wall by an invisible force. This was our apartment, but everything was suddenly different. A melancholy shade of red lit everything. All the furniture and walls, the floor, and the paint itself all looked as though they had been aged a hundred years. Bright red vines covered in thorns grew over everything. Jess screamed again and started crying. Troy, help me! She sobbed with tears rolling down her face. It hurts. God, it hurts. Troy, please. Her back arched and her voice became nothing but sobs and incoherent rambles. The tears continued to pour down her face and her eyes rolled back in her head. I rushed to her in an attempt to pull her down, panic overtaking my emotions. The moment that I made contact with her, I was thrown onto the opposite wall and held by what I assumed was the same, unforeseen force. The wails coming from Jess brought tears to my eyes as I watched her begin to convulse violently. Blood started to trickle from her mouth and her wails became high-pitched gurgles. A small line appeared vertically in the center of her face. I watched horrified as the slit moved from her forehead to her neck. I realized with terror that it was a cut. The slit began to open, and blood dripped down as the skin seemed to peel itself down her head. I struggled to get her down, to help her to do anything. Her body continued to skin itself, and I could do nothing as I watched the muscle and sinew become exposed while listening to the sounds that she was making. I didn't even know humans could make sounds like this. I willed the power to come with everything that I had. I demanded that it release me. I felt it welling up within me. I felt hope. I released the power in a startling display of fury, and then it was gone. Winked out of existence. Jess's skin peeled itself the rest of the way off, revealing glistening muscle, blood, and sinew. Her guts fell to the floor, their own weight causing them to rip and tear out of her. She stopped moving. Tears fell from my face without restraint. My body rumbled. I heard a familiar, deep, and eldritch voice. It was laughter. So, what did you want to show me? Just as confused. I was standing there with my arm outstretched towards the fridge like an idiot. I looked around, still panicked and terrified. Everything was back to normal. Uh, never mind. Let me just move the fridge out for you. I didn't use the power again for months. I was terrified by the very idea of it. The vision of Jess being skinned alive and the unnerving sounds that she had made were forever burned into my memory. We had decided to take a trip to my parents' place for the weekend. It had been a while since I had seen them. It had been roughly four months since the horrific vision had occurred, and I was only just now beginning to let it go. My mother rushed down the steps of her deck and gave me a hug. Welcome home, Trey. I missed you, my little man. Jess giggled. My face flushed, but I let it slide. I love my mom, and her embarrassing names was something she had always done. And I love that too. 
Good to see you again, came my father's gruff voice. He patted my back roughly and gave me a firm handshake. My mother greeted Jess with a hug, and my father gave her a back pat as well, albeit a little gentler than the one that I had received. My parents had a lakeside property with a dock in their backyard. They owned a decently sized rowboat and we decided to take it out for a family fishing trip. We were out for about 4 hours that morning and had managed to catch 3 steelhead. They were a decent enough size that my mom and dad said they would cook them up for dinner. Me and Jess decided that we wanted to spend a little more time on the water and so my parents headed back and before us. We sat on the end of the dock with just our feet in the water, enjoying the atmosphere. After a while, we decided to go back in, lest my parents think we were doing unsavory things. A ten foot ramp with no railing connected the dock to the shore. Jess went up in front of me. At the top of the dock, she lost her balance and started falling right for the water. I wouldn't be able to catch her in time. Without thinking, I summoned the power and I caught her and helped her regain her balance. That was close. She exclaimed, none the wiser that she would have gone over if not for my ability. I looked at my hand as we walked back, wondering what this power actually was. That night, we had an excellent fish dinner. We returned home on Sunday night after a weekend filled with wholesome, heart-filling family time. I had a difficult time falling asleep that night. After a few hours of tossing and turning though, I was finally able to drift off. I woke up in the spare room at my parents house. I felt my blood run cold. The room was lit in red. Bright red thorn vines covered the walls and floor. The bed that I laid in was covered in mold, falling apart and smelled of rancid and wood rot. I quickly jumped out of the bed in disgust and I looked out of the window. The outside world seemed to carry the same look. The sky lit bright red with a white sun. The ground was barren and devoid of life. Dead trees pocked the land. The dock was almost rotted away, and it sat on the floor of the dried up lake. I knew why I was here. I would used my power. I heard a loud thump from the room above me. That was my parents room. I rushed out and up the stairs and I burst into the room. The sight that I beheld caused me to fall to my hands and knees and vomit. My parents were laying in their bed. Both of them had all four limbs cut off completely. The limbs were still sitting next to where they should be attached, giving the illusion that you could just move them an inch or so to reattach them. Neither of them had eyes in their sockets, just bloody gaping holes. I noticed they each held their eyes in their hands. I could see the skin under their fingernails and the blood on their hands. They had ripped out their own eyes. Tears streamed down my face. Why was this happening to me? Why did I have to see something so horrific again? Where are you? I demanded into the air. Why are you doing this? I called out boldly. I was replied to with that same infinite voice, that same violent vibration, the laughter of the one from the void. Once again, I awoke in my own bed covered in sweat. I was done with this. I sat up and I walked to the window when I grabbed the crystal, determined to end this. I looked into it and I slammed my power into it. I don't know what I was hoping for but it worked. I found myself falling into the same void as before. I found that suddenly I was floating in the void again as well, but this time it was different. I could feel the presence of whomever I was in here with. Eventually, I came upon what I was looking for. Dark red mist, the same shade of that as the crystal as far as the eye could see. Occasionally, red lightning bolts lit the mist, exposing the silhouette of what lay beyond. 
Tentacles, larger than mountains covered in suction cups the size of cities, writhed within the mast. With each lightning bolt, the awe-inspiring scale of this being was revealed. My body shook as it communicated with me. I had to struggle to maintain my grasp on my consciousness. I am done with you. It boomed. I saw the same tentacle that had bestowed this power to me before. I was gripped by the force of this being. My ability but a speck of dust by comparison to its power. I could not escape. The tentacle touched my forehead in the same spot as before. I was in my body, watching as I practiced my first time using the power. I lifted the rock and saw a small sliver of light appear in the black void of space above the earth. I threw the rock at the tree. The sliver grew larger. I lifted my gun. The sliver grew larger. I shot the gun. The sliver grew larger, and light poured through angrily. I observed with growing terror as I watched each time I used my power, the light growing into a large white circular form. And then I watched, almost as if in slow motion, as Jess fell over the dock and I saved her. The light became a perfect circle and calmed and dimmed, leaving a perfect white circle. Dark red tentacles larger than mountain ranges began to slither through from the other side, hungrily making their way towards the earth. I was awakened by my phone ringing. Jess answered it. Her face went pale as she passed the phone to me. It was the cops of my parents' town. They had been murdered in their home. The cops said that it was the most gruesome murder case he had ever worked. After forensics had been done, it was found that they had not ripped out their own eyes but each other's. For the next two weeks, I lived in constant fear that vision I saw of Jess would come true. I constantly checked on her. She told me that she understood that I was scared after what had happened to my parents, but she couldn't take me babysitting her like a child. I decided to get rid of the crystal. As I had figured what would happen, I couldn't destroy it, not even with my gun. I took it deep into the woods and I buried it six feet into the ground, in a spot well away from any trail. I planted a fern on top of it to disguise the place of burial forever and told myself that I would never go back. My drive home was filled with nothing but sorrow from the death of my parents. I got home, relieved to be done with the damn crystal and I opened my front door. I leaned down and I took my shoes off and I noticed the smell of rust in the air. I stood up and I went rigid. Not rust. Blood. My mind broke. Just sat slumped on the couch. I laughed. I laughed hysterically, so hard that my ribs hurt. I walked over to her and I stroked her glistening forehead. You forgot to put on your skin today, honey. I cooed lovingly to her. I laughed as I shakily scooped her viscera back into her chest and stomach cavity. You're going to be fine. I couldn't get her guts to stay inside, so after a few minutes, I decided to step outside for some fresh air. I looked up at the sun and I noticed it looks more white than yellow today. Large, snake-like shadows writhed over it, causing the light of day to darken and brighten dramatically. I noticed other people looking up as well with squinted eyes trying to see what was causing these strange phenomena. I put my hand in the railing of my front porch and felt something prick me. I looked. It was a bright red vine. <laughs>